So good morning, everyone. It's nice to see all of you here. I can see some of you, thanks to those of you with your camera on. I know it's a lot to have your camera on for two hours for a lecture <laughs> that you are attending. So feel free to turn it on and off, but it's fun to see all of you for a few minutes at least. Uh, I know some of you here, it's really nice to see that you are here with us today this morning. And uh, my name is Alyssa Bronstein. I'm a professor of economics at Colorado State University. And I see at least one person here from CSU. Hi, <laughs> Deb. So today will be the first in two sessions that I will be teaching. Uh, this first session is an introductory session, which gives you sort of an overview of gender and macroeconomics. And then towards the last part of the session, we'll talk about care in that context. And then tomorrow we will get more deeply into talking about growth and distribution in the context of gender, care, and macro. So I'm going to start by sharing my screen. Well, first, let's see. I'm going to start the PowerPoint. I'm trying to do this in a way, right, that um, play from the current slide that I can still see the chat and so sort of see all of you. Okay, here we go. So I'm sharing my screen. Okay, can you see that all right? Yeah. Yeah. Great. And you can hear me. Thank you, everyone. Um, so I'm just going to get started because there is a lot to cover this morning. Uh, so gender care and macro, an introduction. Going to give you an overview of today's session. So first, I want to give some preliminaries that gives you a sense of sort of where I'm coming from in terms of talking about production and reproduction from a feminist perspective. And looking over some of the sessions that you've already had, I think, right, some of these, some of the elements of this will be review, but I think it's important to situate myself and the kinds of things that I'm talking about in relation to gender and macroeconomics. Uh, then, oh, did you lose the PowerPoint? Uh, no, we still see it. Okay, good, because I moved it from one monitor to another and sometimes <laughs> it disappears. Okay, and then I will move into giving you an overview of the evolution and current state of work on gender and macroeconomics, drawing in particular from the assigned reading uh, from Stephanie Sabrino that was published last year in Feminist Economics on Gender and Macro. So starting off with theoretical approaches, then going into gender and growth, and how the theory moves into the empirics, and then talking about the variety of um, the variety of work that has looked at the differential macro policy effects uh, on women versus men. Then we'll talk about care in particular in this context. And if there's time, we'll go into a closing exercise where we'll talk about the sustainable development goals uh, from the United Nations and think about how different discussions in the context of gender and macro can lend insights into that context. And as a pause here, I think, you know, before I, uh, uh, I took a, a leave of absence a couple of years ago and I worked as a macro person, a macro, a macro economist at the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development in Geneva, Switzerland. And I worked in their division of globalization strategies. And one of the really interesting aspects of uh, doing that work was uh, I was working among a group of macro economists. And so usually in my academic work, I am the macroeconomist among 
uh, scholars that do gender. In this context, I was the gender economist among scholars who do uh, macroeconomics. And so it really helped me sort of strengthen the links and the arguments that I make in relation to sort of real world policy questions. And so I think that the SDGs or the sustainable development goals in that context are a great framework to think about the application of gender and macro and the important insights that it can afford. So I hope we have time to get to that exercise. So starting off with the preliminaries, feminism, production, and reproduction. So I'll start off by talking about feminism, particularly right in the context of economics. And an important prior, I think, to consider here is how one's identity, and in this case, I'm thinking about gender, but also, you could think right in terms of race or ethnicity or um, national origin. Your identity, of course, substantially influences the production of knowledge and the choices we make about theory. And in particular, gender identity affects the sorts of questions we ask. And an important example, right, that this entire uh, 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 course is built on is the legacy of the invisibility of care and non-market work. And I know that you had a couple a uh, session or a couple of sessions with Nancy Fulbray and uh, she I'm sure she talked about some of this, but I wanted to pause here and talk give you an example about how gender identity impacts how non-market work has uh, uh, is treated in economics. Right, and the quintessential example of this is Adam Smith's Invisible Hand, this quote that all of us encountered in our economics education. It's not from the benevolence of the butcher, the brewer, or the baker that we expect our dinner, but from regard to their self-interest. Now, of course, butchers, brewers, and bakers weren't making Smith his dinner. In fact, for most of his life, Smith lived with his mother who died in 1784 at the age of 90 and Smith died about six years later. And we also know that butchers, brewers, and bakers don't make our dinner, but it takes, they, they provide the raw materials and it takes uh, someone else in Smith's case, namely his mother, to do the organizing and preparation of those raw materials to actually provision our dinner. <laughs> Smith, <laughs> Smith was of the opinion that labor, which did not result in a commodity, i.e. was not bought and sold in markets, was unproductive. And this was a break from the past in terms of how uh, we thought about production that came with the rise of labor markets in the 18th and 19th centuries. Prior to that, women's unpaid family labor had been considered economically important, in fact, essential. So the legacy that we've inherited from this perspective is that non-market labor, labor which has not been commodified, is not included in estimates of economic output. So continuing then, returning to the feminism part. So our gender identity affects the kinds of questions we ask, but it also affects how we go about understanding or answering them. And one aspect of this, I think, is what kinds of economic theories we choose to answer them, uh, the extent to which we feel, for instance, that modeling gives a good foundation for understanding their results, the extent to which we feel comfortable using mathematics to ask or answer questions like this. And so I think that the core project of sort of feminist economics is how can we improve economic theory and policy by incorporating a gender aware perspective? The underlying uh, motivation, I think, of this entire course. 
Um, Professor Bronstein, are you yeah. seeing slides because we are on the overview of today's session? That's the slide we Oh, see. you're still, yeah, I am doing okay. slides. So I think that the, when I moved the, um, I am, mm -hmm. when I moved the uh, monitors, I had a problem. So I'm going to share it again. Okay, and now you can see feminism production and reproduction. Yeah. Okay, so uh, apologies for that. Thank you for bringing that up. And please, if the slides don't move, let me know. So feminism, your positionality affects the kinds of questions you ask, right? And the theories or methodologies that you use to answer them. Talking about production then, uh, this is how most economists understand economic growth. You have endowments on the one hand, which we typically, typically think of as physical capital, natural resources, how much coastline do you have, uh, which also overlaps with geography. And then there's human capital, which is typically captured in terms of measures of education and health, for instance. And these endowments are combined with technology to produce income. That's the production side of things. Uh, some endogenous growth theorists or growth theorists that also think about institutions may talk about the impact, for instance, of globalization or different legal or social institutions, the impacts that these have on endowments and technology and result in production. Uh, gender inequality as an institutional constraint uh, is something that comes into play here in most mainstream approaches to growth and production. We'll talk more about this, more specifically about this in a minute, but uh, there's a large body of empirical work that deals with the issue of how gender equality is conducive to higher rates of income or production. So I wanna pause here for a moment and say something about why, in fact, we're talking about economic growth in the feminism production and reproduction. I think, and we'll have other opportunities to talk about this both today and tomorrow, but I think it's important to pause and say something here. In particular, I think it's important from a development perspective. Uh, increases in per capita incomes are not sufficient, but they are essential for sustained improvements in well-being. And I think one reflection of this is the inclusion of growth in Sustainable Development Goal 8, uh, decent work and economic growth. It's also the case that economists and policy makers care and talk about economic growth. So even if you think growth is you know, and I would agree, is uh, not a very good uh, measure of well-being or economic achievements. It's important to have a seat at the table when these conversations are happening, particularly in terms of discussions about care. So that's another reason that I think it's important for economists that consider care and reproduction or consider themselves feminist economists in particular to talk about economic growth. Now on the reproduction side of things. Uh, so I talk about social reproduction and define it in terms of the time and commodities it takes to reproduce the labor force. And here I have a woodcut that comes from an image of a woodcut that comes from the cover of Nancy Fulbright's uh, Who Pays for the Kids. And there's both a short and long-term view on reproducing the labor force. We often think of reproducing the labor force in the long-term in terms of fertility and investments 
in human capital. But in fact, reproduction takes place every single day as illustrated in this factory where workers go into the factory and they labor all day. They come home at night where they are restored and renewed in order to show up at the factory the next day. But it is the case that almost all economic growth models do not treat labor as produced or maintained. To the extent that they do, they typically take into account only formal education uh, and to some extent demographic changes in terms of fertility. But these dynamics are treated outside of the model and tend to ignore the important the, or the significant amount of inputs that go into preparing children to receive education, as well as taking care of elders when they can no longer work or uh, the disabled. So there are important consequences uh, from an economic analysis perspective of undervaluing care work. And an example that I like to use is uh, evaluating austerity, this sort of hospital stay example, um, where market efficiencies are generated simply by transfers to the non-market sector. So imagine uh, getting uh, some sort of um, operation, I don't know, uh, <laughs> get it, you know, uh, uh, that takes maybe, you know, a week to recover in the hospital or two weeks to recover in the hospital. You can cut health spending and lower that stay from two weeks to one week. From the perspective of the hospital and spending, right, there's been an increase in efficiency because you're providing the same service. Uh, namely the operation and some recovery from it, but you're only spending, you've cut down the, the amount of time at the hospital by an entire week, but that patient doesn't recover any faster. They return home and are now being taken care of through the unpaid labor, labor of the family and the community. So what looks like a market efficiency has actually been generated by transfers to the non-market sector. And this sort of blindness effectively presumes unlimited supplies of non-market caring labor. And this is a point made long ago by Diane Elson and others about structural adjustment programs, which we'll return to later. So then the question, I think that gender care and macro poses is how does allowing for social reproduction change our analysis of various public policies or strategies for structural transformation, growth and development. So now I want to move into moving away from the preliminaries, feminism production and reproduction and start with an overview of work on gender and macro and begin with its theoretical approaches and how these are very much situated in the masculinity of macroeconomics. And I would actually say maybe it's the hyper-masculinity of macroeconomics. As you all know, economics itself is a more masculine field. About a third of graduate students and first year PhDs are women in the United States. Uh, this number hasn't changed for about two decades. Uh, the pipeline is extremely leaky as women advanced up as women advance up the ranks of professorships at PhD granting institutions in the US, they advance at a much slower rate than men. So in 2018, only 15% of tenured full professors at PhD granting institutions were women. So this has an impact on the kind of theory that is being taught and the kinds of uh, PhD economists that are getting produced. 
And so within the, dis the, the broad discipline of economics, macro is one that is very masculine. There are very few women involved in macro. Uh, but there have been important interventions in the area of gender and macro that we'll be talking about today. And indeed, this entire course is based on and contributes to. And to, to give you an overview, uh, sort of a bird's eye view of how that works, uh, a work on gender and macro makes linkages between the macro economy and gender equality and well being. And these linkages work in two directions. So one set of work looks at the impact of the macro economy on gender equality and well being. So the differential impact of macro structure and policy. Maybe the most well known to most people is looking at the impact of labor intensive export orientation on the demand for women's labor and how uh, in semi-industrialized countries, for instance, that uh, engage in a lot of labor intensive exporting, much of that is driven by women's entry into the labor force. Another example is looking at the gender differential impacts of austerity. And we've seen uh, important work contributing to this area coming out of looking at the impacts of COVID-19, for instance, the gender differential impacts. Another aspect of this literature looks at the opposite causal direction, namely the impact of gender on macro structure and performance. A big part of this literature considers the relationships between gender inequality and growth. And I'll talk about those in a moment. Another example that focuses more on agricultural economies looks at gender biased access to credit, land and agricultural inputs and its impact on aggregate productivity. A third piece, which we'll be focusing on at the latter part of today's lecture, as well as tomorrow, accounts for care and social reproduction in both directions, both in terms of the gender differential impacts of macro structure and policy, as well as how gender and care affect the structure and performance of the economy. But backing up a little bit and then thinking about feminist macro in particular and linking back to my discussion of feminism production and reproduction, I think the guiding feature here is what happens when economists treat care as productive work. So starting out with theoretical approaches uh, and thinking about these in terms of different groups of models. So neoclassical growth models, these tend to focus on the long run. And in the long run, the driving element is the supply side. So here's an example of what a solo growth model equation might look like. It's an augmented solo growth model because it has A, which refers to technology uh, that is, uh, produces growth in combination with K, physical capital, H, human capital, and L, the quantity of labor. And so you can see this augmented solo growth model in terms of the figure that I introduced before on how most economists think about growth. So, uh, K, H, and L are part of endowments, and A is an aspect of productivity. So in these kinds of growth models, there really is no consideration of how gender affects productivity or physical capital accumulation, K. There is wide potential for consideration of women's care responsibilities, on both the sort of quality of human capital H as well as the quantity L and long run productivity growth. I think within this category of neoclassical growth models, 
you have these more specific models that are overlapping generations models, which tend to have representative agents and these agents interact in household decision making, which results in decisions about schooling and work. And there are a lot of interesting things about these models. They permit analysis of resource allocation and growth across generations, hence the overlapping generation model aspect. So gender then does come into play to some extent. Gender affects time allocation, for instance, between productive and reproductive work. Sometimes these models include intra-household bargaining that then has consequences for these decisions. Now, these models are long-run models, right? So they assume complete labor market flexibility and full employment. So decisions that households make about labor supply are in no way sort of constrained by the availability of gainful employment. And what this looks like is that then there's no, there are no demand side constraints. There's no problem with involuntary unemployment or insufficient capacity utilization. Uh, and in this sense, there's no impact of, of gender inequality in the labor market on the functioning of the labor market. So I think that there's a lot of potential in these kinds of models to incorporate gender considerations, but in practice, um, they, the, the considerations are very much right, uh, centered on the long run supply side and limited by the assumption of no demand side constraints. In contrast to these sorts of neoclassical growth models, we have Keynesian, Kaleckian, heterodox structuralist <laughs> types of models, which is a broad category. And these models deal in both the short and the long run challenges of growth. And in that sense, they account for both the demand and supply sides. So important, I think, common features of these models are that aggregate demand and distribution, for instance, between capital and labor, both of these affect the level of output or economic activity, production, and employment. There's typically excess capacity in these kinds of models meaning that there's involuntary unemployment. So not everyone who wants a job can find one. They also are, uh, uh, in terms of firms, they tend to be in perfectly competitive product and labor markets with sort of cost plus pricing and firms have price setting power in that sense. And an important aspect of these kinds of models is that they emphasize differences in economic structure. So for instance, the extent of industrialization or the extent of agricultural production become important structural features of these models. So backing up and thinking about going back to neoclassical models and thinking about theory, there's been a lot of important work applying theory to empirics and how gender inequality in different aspects of human capital affect the rate of growth. And one strand of this literature focuses on gender equality in education and that gender arguing that gender equality in education stimulates growth. The key mechanisms that are hypothesized here are two. So one is selection bias depresses economy-wide productivity. And by selection bias, I mean that if you presume that women and men have equal aptitudes, if you are choosing um, educational opportunities based on gender as opposed to ap aptitude, you will have uh, depressed productivity because of this selection bias. 
So you'll have sort of less uh, capable folks taking up sp spots and scarce education opportunities because of their gender. And if the opportunities are more equitably distributed across women and men, you'll have higher average productivity overall. So one of the presumptions behind these arguments is that more educational equity on gender will lower gender wage gaps. And this, of course, is connected to the sort of neoclassical presumption that uh, human capital determines your wages. Uh, so workers are paid their sort of marginal product of labor as opposed to being socially determined. But we can get back to that later when we talk about gender wage gaps. So that's one mechanism is the selection bias. A second mechanism between greater educational equity and growth happens through raising the opportunity cost of children in these models. So if you if you know there's more educational investment in children, it raises the cost of having them and lowers fertility. Uh, with and induces households to shift from having more children to instead having fewer children and investing more in those children. And so this shift from child quantity to quality is hypothesized to help drive productivity growth. So that's another way that gender equality in education is hypothesized to stimulate growth in these models. And the relationship between gender equality and education has been based on a variety of empirical studies and has become what we call in mac macro, I think, effectively a stylized fact. But uh, there are a number of critiques. So for instance, uh, many of these studies have omitted variables. There are other aspects of gender equality that are correlated with education that may be contributing to economic growth. A second aspect is that, um, as some of you may have observed, that women's education actually in exceeds or is higher than men's in some regions. You find this in many countries, for instance, in Latin America. And so there's a new question that has arisen, which what is the impact of men falling behind? We also know that educational convergence does not automatically induce employment convergence, that employment gaps between women and men are trailing behind the convergence of education gaps. And so here is an illustration of what those differences look like. Um, it's a kernel density function, which is basically like a histogram. So you have the frequency of countries along the, um, or, or the frequency of countries along the vertical axis, and then along the horizontal axis, you have two measures. Uh, one, the blue line is the female to male employment to population ratio, and the sort of dashed red line is the female to male gross secondary enrollment rate. You can see that the mean of the secondary enrollment rate, which is used as a measure of educational inequality, is very narrow. Um, and so most countries are concentrated around a pretty even gender mean as compared to the female to male employment to population ratio. So here the curve is much flatter. Countries are distributed across a much broader variety of values and the mean is much lower. So, here, I thought it would be a good place to pause and reflect for a few moments. And here I have a question uh, for you all to consider. Is closing education gaps sufficient to ensure women's economic empowerment via employment? Why or why not? Uh, what I'd like to do is just break up in groups of two for about five minutes 
and then come back together and share some responses with the larger group and open discussions. So welcome back. I'm going to share my screen again. Okay, so you can see the, uh, the last slide where, which is where we paused before and asked the question about closing education gaps and whether they're sufficient to ensure women's economic empowerment via employment. Uh, Ina, did my slides progress? Yes, we're at okay. gender, macro, and employment. Great. <laughs> so, so we were talking about education gaps, right, which is one important point of entry in the sort of gender and macro empirical literature. Another important point of entry is one on gender gaps in employment. Uh, and its impact on economic growth and other macroeconomic outcomes. And so gender gaps in employment uh, can result from a lot of different dynamics. On one level, you have constrained choices in the household. One that we'll, you all are talking about a lot in these couple of weeks are women's disproportionate responsibility for unpaid care work, which impacts their labor supply. We talked about norms and stereotypes in terms of education and the limits those place on the relationship between education and employment outcomes. Uh, wage gaps that exist already in favor of men with unpaid care work obligations combined lead families to select the lowest paid adult to provide uh, unpaid care work, right? And it creates this sort of ongoing cycle of gender wage gaps, which tends to uh, uh, support or encourage women's disproportionate responsibility for unpaid care. But there are also constraints that are external to the household or individual, which we talked about. You could think of them as demand side constraints, institutional constraints social constraints. One example is employer discrimination, right? Insufficient aggregate demand or job vacancies. Uh, there are uh, institutional constraints. Some brought up the, the differential expectations around maternity leave and how that might discourage employers from hiring women. So, there are those theoretical connections between gender differences in employment and growth. And there's also been a very large empirical uh, aspect of research that connects these two. So in terms of like education on the theoretical side, why would gender gaps in employment lower growth? Like education, you have selection distortion effects. So if individuals are chosen for employment based on their gender as opposed to their capacities, you're going to end up with selection distortion types of inefficiencies. Uh, it's also the case uh, that like my, my austerity example at the beginning of the lecture and the shift in women's production from unpaid to paid work, shifting women's production in this way and closing gender employment gaps in terms of paid employment uh, will also contribute directly to economic growth simply because activities are now being captured by the market when before they were not. So again, most of these kinds of uh, analyses look at employment strictly from the supply side of things, but it's important to incorporate the role of macro context and structure. Uh, when one is looking exclusively at the microeconomic level, it misses how macro factors shape the extent and structure of labor demand. And there are important consequences for gender equality in employment. So I, I wanna give you an example of this that also brings out, I think some of the points that uh, were made in our previous discussion in terms of differences in women's collective bargaining power. And uh, here I'm gonna give you uh, 
an example of some work that I did with, with Stephanie Subuino, which gives an illustration of a feminist heterodox approach to understanding these dynamics in terms of the failures of structural transformation. And the context in which this work is drawn is one that takes on global trends that I'm sure you all are familiar with. Uh, education gaps have substantially narrowed what we just talked about, but there's been far less improvement in gender employment gaps, uh, but some progress over time. At the same time, we've actually seen that where women's employment has increased, the segregation of women and men into different sorts of jobs uh, based on gender has actually worsened. So in this context, we wanted to try to explain this model in terms that took into account the political economy of inclusion and markets among the international financial institutions. So as many of you are probably aware, right, this discussion of inclusion has really taken over global development policy discussion. And in many ways, I think that this turn towards expanding the scope of market, so including women more in economic activities, has been offered as a way to address the challenges of modern capitalism or the failures of modern capitalism. And these discussions very often put these failures in terms of supply side problems. So again, I'm talking about the supply versus the demand side. So these supply side problems put it at people are marginalized from economic opportunities because they have insufficient assets or insufficient human capital or skills, or they lack the right information or literacy. And so this has really underscored, I think, the gender equality and work or economic growth agenda. And once again, getting back to the macro perspective, this is really a supply side story, this inclusion in markets and fails to take account of the demand side. So in this work, we very much wanted to introduce the importance of the demand side in terms of talking about the political economy of exclusion and how it's really a macro thing that has to do with the evolution of global capitalism and how this has contributed to rising inequality and limited availability of good or better jobs relative to labor supply. And so when there's this job scarcity, one of the ways that scarce jobs get allocated is by gender. So here are a couple of uh, figures the right hand figure is a subset of the left hand figure and on the horizontal axis, we have changes in men's employment rates uh, between 1991 and 2014. So you can see that most countries are to the left of the vertical axis, which means that men's employment rates have been declining among most countries. On the um, vertical axis, we have changed the change in women's to men's employment rate over the period. So this reflects, and, and most countries are above the horizontal line, which reflects the fact that women's employment rates have been increasing relative to men. So the upper left-hand quadrant is what we ask might be a gender conflictual quadrant, which is where women's employment is increasing relative to men's as men's employment is declining. So might that be a gender conflictual space where women's employment is increasing potentially at the expense of men's? Uh, the right-hand figure gives uh, is a subset of the left-hand figure, as I said, and it divides developing countries among different regions in Africa, uh, America, and Asia. There seems to be, sorry. I'm supposed, to, uh, sorry, I was just looking at the, the, the chat. It's tough to do a presentation and look at the chat at the same time. <laughs> 
So the analytical framework that we apply to look at these issues is one that combines the notion of stratification, which is systems of structural and intentional distribution buttressed by institutions, norms, and stereotypes that create social and economic hierarchies in which some groups are identified as more deserving than others. And one can uh, uh, provide insights into stratifications based on gender, based on race and ethnicity, intersections of different forms of stratification. And in order to understand these dynamics, we combined the notion of stratification with duo or segmented labor market theory, where the labor market is divided into sort of primary sector jobs that are better jobs with higher wages, more likely to be formal and associated with benefits versus the secondary sector, which is a more marginal sector, more likely to be informal, low wages. So when you combine this perspective of stratification with one that understands labor market as being segment, labor markets as being segmented uh, by different sorts of jobs, when you combine those two and introduce the problem of job scarcity, what you get is a sort of rationing or opportunity hoarding by gender, which is what we look at in this in this work, but you can also look in terms of other groupings, like in particular race and ethnicity, and the crowding of women into lower quality jobs. And we were particularly interested in the challenges or failure of uh, structural transformation. And so in particular, looking at the exclusion of women from the industrial sector to the extent that it proffers better jobs than uh, agriculture or traditional services. Uh, in the process of development and structural transformation, industry relative to agriculture and services, it's more likely to be formal, higher wage, less vulnerable work. And part of the process of productivity enhancing structural change and development is about resources, including labor, shifting into higher productivity sectors to support aggregate productivity growth. And this access to higher paying jobs, right, helps build domestic aggregate demand, which serves as another source of structural transformation. And it's happened uh, for most countries that have achieved higher income status through the process of industrialization. But what we've seen in the past 30 years uh, is premature deindustrialization, stalled industrialization, and the disappointment of service sector growth. And here's uh, an illustration that industrial employment has been uh, declining across all kinds of countries developed or developing or transition. And so what you see here then is that as women's relative employment has been increasing across different regions, uh, which you can see in the column of the percentage point change, which is women's employment, relative employment to population rate relative to men, their concentration in industrial employment has been declining, which is the far right column. So as women have been increasing their employment participation relative to men, women have also been increasingly excluded from industrial sector work. So, Back to gender macro employment and theory, I've been taking sort of a, 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 a side trip here. I want to talk about, right, come back to the point of how it's important to incorporate the role of macro structure and context to understand the relationship between gender equality, employment, and macroeconomic outcomes. So what we see is that as women have been increasing their employment, that gender segregation is high and increasing in most countries, particularly in the industrial sector where many high quality jobs are located. 
And some of you may be familiar with the work that we've seen evidence for a defeminization of manufacturing jobs as capital intensity and wages increase. So even as women's education is increasing, right, which should increase their access to these higher wage jobs, in fact, they have less access. And the sort of macro structural constraints of stalled industrialization, premature deindustrialization has affected jo gender job segregation and women's relative access to good jobs. So the conclusions then is that industrial structure matters, right? And aggregate demand matters. There has to be a sufficient supply of so-called good jobs. So now that we've taken this foray into education and employment, going back to the theory and talking about gender and growth, in particular in feminist heterodox macro models, right? So outside of the realm of the supply side uh, long run perspective, a number of feminist heterodox macro models take into account these considerations of the demand side uh, and institutional constraints and how gender norms and stereotypes come into play. And key features of this sort of work include the gender division of labor in both the labor market and in terms of unpaid work. Uh, some of this work also considers gender differences in spending patterns, both in terms of gender differences in consumption but also gender differences in saving. This work is structuralist in the sense that stylized structural features of economies also consider uh, an incorporation of how those structural features connect with the distribution of power. And so common features, we have structure, macro level policies, monetary and fiscal policies come into play. Uh, there are oligopolistic market structures where firms exercise market power in terms of pricing and wage setting. This is versus uh, the presumption of competitive markets in most neoclassical models. International trade comes into play and it has an impact on price elasticities, right? So there are limits to wage increases because one faces potentially decreasing external demand. There are balance of payments constraints, intergroup inequalities, both between men and women or between labor and capital or between within the group of labor between white workers, say, and black workers come into play. Uh, gender job segregation is important, as is bargaining both in the household, where we're more familiar with seeing uh, bargaining relations, but also in the labor market, and it's differentiated uh, by gender. So I want to give you uh, an important example of this kind of work from Stephanie Seguino's work that connects gender inequality in employment with economic growth. And she's a feminist heterodox macroeconomist. So for her, it's a, gender effects really depend on economic structure. And her focus in this early classic work is on semi-industrialized export-oriented economies, which have a large share of exports in women-dominated industries. And her hypothesis is that gender wage inequality stimulates growth potentially in export-oriented economies. And so here I wanna pause and signal this differentiation between or among different types of gender inequality. So we talked about gender inequality in education and its macro consequences. We talked about gender inequality in employment rates and its macro consequences. Here, Stephanie Seguino is talking about 
gender-based wage inequality in particular, and hypothesizing actually that inequality can contribute to growth, which runs against right the standard framing of this relationship. And the causal mechanisms that she posits in this work is that there's gender job segregation where women are crowded into lower paying jobs, uh, namely in export oriented sectors. And women's lower wages then in these export oriented sectors are good because women are producing more price elastic goods, meaning that they face the goods that they produce face more global competition. So wages are an important part of global competitiveness. And this structural feature, right, this gender segregation in these particular industries in and of itself lowers women's bargaining power because the goods they produce are more price, to, price elastic. The firms that they work for face more global competition. So it lowers their bargaining power. And so the results then are that gender wage inequality, women's lower wages can actually help drive export expansion and earn more foreign exchange and help pay for or sponsor the technical change that for higher foreign exchange earnings can drive with positive consequences for growth. And this underlies this dynamic that some have called the feminization of foreign exchange earnings. So one way of making one's exports more competitive, right, is to engage in a devaluation, uh, but women's institutionally lower wages can have the same effect. And so gender wage inequality then can be associated with higher profits and actually raise the rate of capital accumulation and growth. So it's important then what this work indicates among many things is that it's important to be specific about the type of gender inequality that you're talking about in terms of its relationship to growth. So then a pause for review, we've talked, I've talked a lot about the gender inequality and in growth literature, an important subset, right, of the gender macro literature and the kind of stylized facts that have emerged are that gender inequality in health, education, and employment participation is associated with lower growth uh, empirically, all else equal. The question of gender wage gaps though is more open and in line with the contributions that Stephanie Seguino has made, it really depends on economic structure. What this literature, the standard literature on gender inequality and growth does, however, is that it largely ignores reproduction and the production of labor. And to the extent that it does come up in this literature, care responsibilities are most often modeled as a constraint on women's market participation. So it comes into play on the supply side of things, on the labor supply side as a constraint on women's market participation. So that's the gender inequality in growth literature. There's also an important set of this gender and macro literature that focus on the macro policy effects on gender equality. And probably the earliest aspect of this literature considers globalization policies and trade and investment liberalization. And I think maybe the most classic contribution to this literature is the impact of globalization on employment and Guy Standing's classic article on global feminization through flexible labor. And he starts on the point that all countries that have successfully industrialized in the modern era have done so by mobilizing large numbers of women. And right, you can see some echoes of Stephanie Seguino's work in Standing's argument. 
Uh, women's low wages plus cost minimization are part of the export-led industrialization model. And where he, he moves forward is in talking about how the types of work and the labor relations in terms of income and insecurity and lack of benefits, the, this, this uh, uh, collection of features that we typically associate with women's work is spreading to men's work as well. And that's what he means by global feminization through flexible labor. Uh, and noting that women tend to lose their comparative advantage in these jobs as the industries upgrade and the jobs get better, more technologically intensive, uh, higher wage. There's also been an important uh, subset of the macro policy effects on gender equality literature that looks at the impact of trade and investment liberalization on gender wage gaps. There's a standard neoclassical trade theory story here that opening up to trade and investment should lower gender wage gaps because it raises the relative demand for women's labor uh, on the one hand. On the other hand, the logic is that trade and investment liberalization increase market competition, which raises the cost of minimization. This is the standard uh, Gary Becker argument that more competitive markets drive out discrimination. Empirical studies of these uh, predictions, as you might expect, are highly mixed. Uh, Increased global competition uh, in many studies has low, shown lowers the scope for wage growth. Higher capital mobility through investment liberalization can also impact workers' bargaining power. And as we've seen, women lose their comparative advantage in export-oriented jobs as these industries upgrade. So there has been a connection between technological change in particular and a decline in the relative demand for women's labor. A number of studies look at fiscal policy in particular and the gender differential effects of austerity and cuts in public budgets, and in particular, how they raise demands on care. Uh, another subset, some of it neoclassical in sort of structure, looks at public investment and its impact on physical infrastructure, how it can crowd in private investment, but that how it can also alleviate supply side constraints in terms of women's unpaid care burden and encourage their participation in paid work. Uh, a number of really compelling studies, some I'll talk more about in just a few minutes looks at public investment in social infrastructure in particular, and how public investment by social infrastructure, I mean uh, investments in education and health, uh, in care provisioning, how it can not only alleviate women's unpaid care time, but also raises demand for women's labor and paid care services. So it has these positive employment effects. Uh, and, and, and along similar lines, some studies that look at the macro policy effects on gender equality in terms of fiscal, look at the importance of counter cyclical and full employment policies. Another set, which I know some folks have been talking about in the chat to the extent that I can uh, <laughs> digest it, looks at the impact of monetary policy in particular and uh, most of these have been focused on looking at the differential effects of both formal and informal inflation targeting. So the kinds of monetary policies like high interest rates or overvalued exchange rates that are associated with keeping inflation very low in developing country contexts and the differential impacts by gender, race, and ethnicity. Some early work I did with James Heinz looked at the impact in developing and emerging economies and found unsurprisingly that tight monetary policies are overwhelmingly contractionary, meaning they suppress economic activity, 
but in developing country contexts, at least, they constrain women's employment more than men's. In developed economies, uh, James Heinsohn and Stephanie Seguino applied a similar sort of analysis to the United States and found that ethnic minorities and the less educated and the less skilled saw greater employment losses with higher interest rates. Uh, the work on gender in developed economies is less conclusive, but one thing I can say is I think that there's insufficient accounting for intergroup inequality overall, meaning subsets, uh, or, or meaning looking at women by gender and race versus men, uh, or by uh, nationality status. But one thing that does emerge from this body of literature is this point I made a little while ago on employment and the connections between the, or the importance of stratification and political economy that as in many areas, subordinate groups shoulder a disproportionate share of the cost of tight monetary policy or inflation targeting. So I, I, I want to do a pause for reflection. I was going to do like a real uh, 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 big pause, but I'm going to put this at the end. So uh, uh, meeting for as an exercise, because I, I want to keep going. It's taking me longer than I thought it would. But we can pause for reflection in terms of revisiting right this gender and macro figure that I presented at the beginning. And we've talked about different sets of analyses, one which looks at the differential impact of macro structure and policy on gender equality and gendered well being, and the second which looks at the opposite causal direction, the impact of gender relations on the structure and performance of the macro economy. So now I want to finally insert into this discussion studies which explicitly look at how accounting for care and social reproduction affects our understanding of these dynamics. So thinking about care in the macro economy in the early years, I think we can tag the sort of beginning of its modern variety in the 1980s and feminist economic critiques of structural adjustment programs. And this point that I brought up earlier, one made by Diane Elson and others, was that the economic models driving the advice that international financial institutions like the International Monetary Fund or the World Bank gave to developing country governments or that drove conditionalities, these models presumed virtually unlimited supplies of unpaid labor from women and girls. So, in that sense, it almost didn't matter how much you cut from health or education spending. The presumption would be that whatever needs were left by these cuts would be taken up by the non-market sector. And that is then the implicit presumption is that unpaid labor is virtually unlimited. So there was no assessment of the negative consequences for the well-being of women and girls providing this unpaid labor. But there was also no assessment of the negative consequences for the very goals of the programs themselves. So the question is, questions like, how does assuming this virtually unlimited supply of unpaid labor, how does this affect uh, the growth rate right over the course of a number of years, for instance. So coming out of this work uh, is a lot of important insights. I think one in particular I'd like to highlight is Diane Elson and Nilifer Chatai's work on the social content of macro policy and how the relations of production and exchange in the market is embedded in class as well as gender. But it's not only about understanding that embeddedness, but it's also in terms of understanding how the market economy fundamentally depends on unpaid work and care, much of it done by women and girls. And so here you have Diane Elson's 
uh, term, the care economy. So here I thought it would be a good moment to step back and to consider circular flow diagrams, which are typically right, one of the first or second things you do in a macroeconomic class. And here's a traditional circular flow um, between firms and households. So the orange lines represent financial flows. Households spend money in product markets, which generates revenue for firms who then use this revenue to pay wages, rents, and profits in factor markets uh, to labor. And then how this is where households earn income. The purple arrows are goods and services flows. So households provide labor, land, and capital through factor markets to firms uh, who then put, put these factors together and produce goods and services, which are then sold in product markets to households. Of course, this traditional circular flow ignores a lot of things. And this alternative circular flow is one effort to take into account some of the insights um, that the gender care and macro research has done to add it in. And so here we have a domestic sector, uh, which overlaps, I think, with Diane Elson's notion of the care economy. And here we have the actual production of human capabilities flowing into the private sector, but also into the public sector, which is not typically a sector that is represented in the traditional circular flow either. And an important aspect of this domestic sector and the production of human uh, capabilities is the prospect or the possibility of the depletion of those capabilities. And this is the point uh, made uh, about the failure, the early points made about the failure of economic models of structural adjustment programs, which presumed, again, virtually unlimited supplies of unpaid labor. I think another important aspect that gets left out of the traditional circular flow is the impact of the rest of the world uh, in terms of trade, but also in terms of finance and uh, migration. And then in the lower left-hand corner is the domestic banking sector, the international finance part is in the rest of the world part, but that the financial sector has an impact on the real sector and the traditional circular flow abstracts from and or sort of ignores that element. So looking forward then, at the major strands of feminist work that have emerged from these early insights. Uh, I think I included in the reading a, um, a short piece that gives an overview of gender care and macro. Um, one set of work I categorize uh, as looking at national income accounting. A second, focuses on sectoral disaggregation for care aware policy analysis. And a third considers transforming macro modeling, focusing on how incorporating care and social reproduction changes our understanding of macro dynamics. So I wanna give you a little taste, a little flavor of each of these sectors. And, and I think probably some of this was covered in earlier um, lectures with Nancy and others. So the UN system of, la of national accounts, you know, specifies global standards for calculating GDP. And therefore, right, these standards are instrumental in measuring growth and economic performance. As I noted in my discussion of Adam Smith, it's traditionally excluded unpaid care, but also volunteer services, community services, community volunteer services. And it's also long undercounted subsistence and informal market production. 
Now the SNA, the system of national accounts gets successively revised over some years. And these revisions have expanded its traditional production boundary. So now these standards include production for own use, but it still excludes unpaid care work. In the 2008 revision, there was an explicit call for satellite accounts that incorporated unpaid care work, but there are limits to this. Uh, there is still no international consensus on how to do it. Uh, data collection, especially time use surveys, are, are increasingly pursued, but still not very broadly. And I'm sure you talked about this in the section on time use surveys. And so far, this, these satellite accounts, to the extent that they exist, have had very limited impact on macro policy discussions or macro policy making. Parallel to this, of course, there are mounting efforts to just do away with GDP as being so central and replace it with a much better measure of well being, perhaps one right that takes into account the importance of unpaid care work. But GDP is still the dominant performance metric. So to an important extent, we still have to deal with it while also challenging it, I think. So a second, so that's the national income accounting sort of group. A second group has focused on sectoral disaggregation for more care aware policy analysis. And these efforts, try to add on to or disaggregate standard models to make them more care aware uh, and to induce more effective policy choices. So I wanna give you a few examples and you'll be learning about a few of these uh, in your course. So one example adds a household sector to a standard computable general equilibrium model framework. And in these kinds of models, the household sector parallels the market sector um, in the sense of existing alongside of it and being connected to it at certain points. But it's sort of like this parallel play. Yes, check out the working papers from the project. There are lots of good examples here. And I have them also listed in uh, my session readings. So in these kinds of models, prices and preferences determine, right, the distribution of women's time across paid work, unpaid work, and leisure. So the distribution of women's time, as well as the distribution of the time of other household members. And so then these decisions in uh, interaction with prices and demands determine household incomes and some really interesting work um, looking at the consequences for women's welfare, which can be measured in different kinds of ways. You could measure it in terms of women's income, total time use, the distribution of their time use across different kinds of uses. And I think it's in, in uh, you know, I like to give credit where it's due. I think that some of uh, uh, that this perspective in, in certain ways is similar to Gary Becker's notion of the household sector as producing Z goods, right? So households combine commodities with non-market time to produce these Z goods that are like meals, for instance. Um, that are then consumed by the household as an input into household utility. But what is, is interesting about these new efforts is the emphasis on women's primary responsibility for care work, I think. Another example of this sort of approach focuses on fiscal policy. And I referenced some of this earlier and the consequences of public spending on social versus physical infrastructure. And there are examples of this kind of approach also in the working papers from the project. And uh, the, the, the studies that look at this consider how public borrowing um, 
or make the point that public borrowing for investments in physical infrastructure is always substantiated uh, because it yields future returns. So governments can actually borrow money because they're using it as an investment that will yield future returns and enable them to pay back what they've borrowed plus interest. However, public spending on education, health, and care services, what we typically mean when we refer to social infrastructure, is instead treated as current consumption. And uh, it's treated as current consumption, even though it yields future returns in terms of increasing productivity of the future, this kind of spending has also been shown to increase women's labor force participation, both in terms of demand, because the social infrastructure spending expands demand for women's market labor, but it also increases women's labor force participation on the supply side, because it alleviates the constraints that women have on their labor supply based on their care responsibilities. It's also been shown that this kind of social infrastructure spending is much more employment intensive than spending on physical infrastructure. And it creates more employment, not only for women, but also for men with largely because of its larger multiplier effects. So this really interesting work simulates um, demand side effects of expanding social infrastructure in different country contexts, quantifying job creation and their associated multiplier effects. Uh, and, I, and I think it's a great example of how uh, taking a care aware approach to policy analysis can improve economic models and make them more effective um, at producing right, the intended consequences. I think one of the uh, open questions in these kinds of models that for those of you who are interested in this kind of research is what are the longer term productivity effects? So these models are really focused on looking at short term consequences in terms of quantifying job creation and associated multiplier effects, but also in terms of trying to understand its impact on well being. I think an important point to uh, pursue that would strengthen the argument for this kind of spending as investment is to become more specific about what the long-term productivity effects of this kind of spending is. So continuing with this example of sectoral disaggregation for care aware policy analysis and adding on to or disaggregating standard mo models, another example of um, these kinds of approaches is a sort of combo of the last two. One adds a household sector to a macro policy simulation. So you get both a macro micro policy situation, a simulation. And I think, right, the Levy uh, model is a good example of this kind of approach. And you'll be delving into that later this, this week. And it considers the consequences. You can do things like considering the consequences of investing in social infrastructure from many perspectives. Here I list two. One is the impact on overall employment and output. And a second is the impact on household and time use with consequences, right, for individual well being. The last strand is one that takes macro models and, and, and moves into them to introduce care and social reproduction in the context of growth. And this is what we'll be getting into tomorrow, uh, a model that embeds reproduction and gender dynamics into the building blocks of the model and looks at its impacts on uh, productivity and longer term growth questions.
So here at this point, uh, what I'd like to do, uh, I've been talking a lot, <laughs> um, but I had a couple of um, exercises that I had wanted to introduce, but just didn't have time. So what I'm going to do is, is to um, instead put pause now and ask you all to take the last few minutes of class and to consider this figure, gender, care, and macro, uh, which right, tries to summarize or represent the different points of intervention that this kind of work has done. And to think about, uh, to make a list, for you to make a list, to pause and reflect and make a list of gender and macro studies or research questions that you might come up with um, that, and categorize them either under the differential impact of macro structure or policy or under the structure and performance of the macro economy or under accounting for care and social reproduction. Now, if, if this seems like a, a, a reach, you're welcome to use examples from the literature that I've discussed today. But what I'd be really interested in seeing is uh, the kinds of research questions that you might be interested in um, asking or answering. Uh, and then the second part of the exercise, I wanted to talk about relating these to the sustainable development goals, and I'll see if I can do something with that tonight. But for now, what I'd like you to do is to take the last few minutes of class and to, to jot down some notes on ideas that you have on gender care and macro that would come into one of these three categories, and then we'll make a space on Slack. Uh, where we can list all of those so that we can share them with everyone else and um, have any sorts of questions. So I'm stopping my share here, but I wanna pause and ask before we do that, if you have any questions or comments. I know I've been talking for a long time. 